they don't have like a strong person to communicate this stuff, which is to go out and say not that the economy is great, but to go out and say, we were heading into a recession, which Trump drove us into because of COVID, because he mishandled the whole thing. Millions of people's di people died. The economy was in the toilet. And I have been climbing us out of it. That's what I've been doing. I've been having to painstakingly dig us out of his mess. And nobody makes that case. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about the economy. Now, if Joe Biden loses the 2024 election, I'm not saying that he will, but if he does, one of the biggest reasons will be the way that people are feeling about the economy. We're hearing complaints about it from voters across the political spectrum, and Biden gets a lot of the blame. My guest today is my best friend, Jonathan V. Last, editor of The Bulwark and my co-host on two other podcasts, The Next Level, uh, which we do with uh, our buddy Tim Miller, and The Secret Podcast, which if you are not a Bulwark Plus subscriber, you may be missing some of the best content that we have at The Bulwark, which is me and JVL doing a secret podcast together. His daily newsletter, which is uh, the best thing out there, the triad. And then Mona and Charlie also have a version of the secret podcast themselves called Just Between Us. Uh, so you need to go check out all that content. But JVL, thanks for being here, buddy. So excited to be back. And I am ready to give you the best episode of this season's show. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just going to start by setting this up. So if you don't listen to the secret podcast and you are not familiar with me and JVL's dynamic, let me just lay it out for you real quick. JV and L and I fundamentally look at the world in a different way. There's a lot of things we agree on, but we have True. some major fundamental differences. And our number, and so when we do the secret pod, we have like there's threads of disagreement that just like in a marriage where you have the same fight over and over again. We have a version of the same fight, and it really comes down to the different ways that we feel about the people and the things they say. Which Is that fair, do you think? Yeah, you know, I think actually it's it might even be a little deeper than that. Mm. Uh, it might even be a, a difference in how we see the world itself, which is that I always look at the world and see the 15 ways it can get worse. <laughs> And you look at the world and see the 15 ways it can get better. Right? This is that, fair. This is right. And that's basically what this argument is too, right? I mean, we're looking at the economy and I'm looking at it saying, don't you understand how good we have it? This could be as good as it gets. And you're looking and saying, right, but these other things could be better. Yeah. Okay. Right? I is think that, that's fair. fair. I think it's fair. Um, here's the other thing that you don't know if you don't listen to us on the secret podcast or even the next level, which is. Uh, I try to keep JVL as far from the focus groups as possible, lest he have an aneurysm uh, or say something about the people that I find untoward uh, or do a bad impression of an average voter, like a mean impression, a bad voice. And so uh, it is against my better judgment that we're doing this show today. But today, J JVL and I have been having this really long running conversation about the economy Uh where he sort of argues, and I'm not going to, we're going to argue it all out, but I just want to frame it up, where he sort of argues that it is unfair to the actual economy and where it is, the way that voters talk about it being so catastrophically bad. Um, and the thing that I always just say is like, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Like, I listen to these voters across the political spectrum, oh, yeah. week in, week out, and they tell me it's bad. And so I felt like in order to really get at the meat of this. You needed to hear straight from the horse's mouth, these voters mm. talking about it. And so, mm. um, and because I have COVID for the third time, uh, I'm going to do this with half my immune system tied behind my back. And <laughs> we're going to, we're going to, we're going to argue this out once and for all. Um, and so let's get into it here. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, but before I actually, before I hit you with some some audio, and I know you've gone and, and watched a bunch of uh, a bunch oh, of yeah. clips and sections. So we'll talk oh, I'm about prepped. it. I know you're prepped because <laughs> you're just going to argue with everybody. Let's let's. Why don't you frame up your argument about what you think people 
are like, why are they misunderstanding the economy or what do you think is going on? Just frame up your general proposition. Yeah. I mean, did you ever used to watch the show House, which was the, the, it was basically Sherlock Holmes, but with medicine and the House's, Dr. Gregory House's mantra was that everybody lies. And my, my thesis is that people are unreliable narrators about their own lives in every aspect. They're unreliable in their feelings about the economy. They're unreliable in what they think their political views are. And what we have seen emerge, and there's there's a ton of economic data on this, is a massive disconnect between consumer sentiment and economic reality. And the consumer sentiment stuff that we see uh, shows confidence levels and belief about the economy to be where it was during the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. That's what the level of people's feelings about the economy is. That is wildly disconnected from the reality of what we're seeing. That is not to say like everything's great and there's a chicken in every pot and everybody ought to be grateful for Joe Biden. It's just saying there's an objective fact. It's wildly different. And it's not just consumers, in fact. Uh, we have a um, independent small business owners have, has this fantastic chart out where they look at both hard and soft indicators. And uh, this is, again, the people who own businesses. And all of the hard indicators, like sales, hiring, capital investments, are very, very good. And then there's this enormous gulf where the soft indicators are all of these businessmen saying everything is terrible. And this gulf is brand new. This didn't exist before like three years ago. And my thesis is that this thing that we're seeing in the disconnect between people's feelings and the reality, I'm not saying that, that their feelings aren't there. They are very clearly. I'm saying that it's new and it's real. And it's actually more dangerous to Joe Biden and his prospects than if the economy were actually terrible. Because if the economy were actually terrible, then there are things you could do to fix it and people's sentiments would follow that. Once you sever that connection, then you're just like at the mercy of vibes. And I'm not sure how how you fix the vibes on stuff. Does that sound reasonable? Is that I think that is uh, it is clearly articulated. I do not um I think personally, I think something different is going on. I think that the the old way that we measure satisfaction versus the new things that people are confronting right now, the challenges are creating this gulf. I don't just think it's a difference between perception and reality. Um, and hmm. so, uh, and I'll, I'll, we can dig into that more, but We're I want to start. Cause I'm going to impeach some of your witnesses. I know, their, I know you reality. are. I know what okay. you did with your prep time. Um, and I can't wait. That's is great. Uh, okay. Let's go right in. I want to start with, uh, let's just, I mean, and this, we could have gone to any focus group to pick these out, but let's just throw up when we throw up some, some audio of when we say, how do you think things are going in the country? Hit it. Everyone I know is always unemployed. With inflation rising, wages aren't rising. Rents in cities are extraordinarily high. People aren't able to buy houses anymore on middle-class salaries. It seems the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Crime is really bad in cities. I guess I'll just stop there. I know that supposedly the economy is doing better, like the GDP is up and things, but for me, it does not feel that way. I know that some things are cheaper, but overall life is getting more expensive. Trying to buy a house right now, like I told my parents that if people my age or younger, like they don't have a house now, they're not going to have one. Just like anybody actually think they'll retire. <laughs> I don't even know, 75, because I'm getting up there and it's getting closer, but it just, I still feel like I'm the same, you know, 10 years ago, trying to pay down debts and things like that. I feel fortunate that I don't want kids, but I also know just factually I couldn't afford it if I did want it. And just if we look at numbers, I mean, I think maybe like 10 years ago, the average cost of raising a child from zero to 18 without college tuition was around $200,000. And now that's much closer to $300,000. Who has that amount of money just to spend? Cost of living, like you mentioned, is kind of tough. We were fortunate enough to just get a home, but it was kind of difficult. And so I do feel like things are turning around, just not very quickly. But like you mentioned, I do see light at the end of the tunnel. Because our economy is so bad, but we're sending all this foreign aid, you know, to Ukraine and everything like that. Nothing else is like going back into our economy. 
Um, it just seems like they made all these changes, inflation, prices are higher, things like that, and there's nothing being done to offset that. Eggs at one point were insane, and then it's like, okay, eggs are normal again. But like everything else is still just like so expensive, and it's almost like impossible just to go food shopping and get gas in your car. So far, everything's pretty stagnant. Money's not worth as much. I'm getting 4.3% in a savings account. I remember back when that was a five-year CD rate. That's that's pretty insane. So money's definitely worth a lot less. 33 with two kids. I make decent money, but here lately, past couple of years, it does not feel like it at all. So I'd say we're in a pretty bad spot. So here's my opening question to you. Who do you think all those people voted for? I, I I mean, this is cheating because I saw all this stuff. Oh, uh, did you, you see the guide? Yeah, I know. I I listened to all of the sound. Um, <laughs> so here is here's the thing, right? So when I make this argument about uh, there's this big disconnect, a lot of Democrats say to me, it's because of Fox News. And I say to them, no. I mean, Fox News may be part of the, the factor, but these sentiments, and this is the reason I'm so freaked out about it and why I've said it's like a mass delusion, they are across the board. Democrats feel the same way. Right. So to be clear, the answer is all of those people voted for Joe Biden. Those right. are not two-time Trump voters who are trying to find a sort of political reason to say that yeah. things are bad. Yes. This is, this is what I'm saying. Like, this is, you know, it is broad and you can't bury your hand. This is why I'm so freaked out about all this. It's not like I'm arguing people because I, I want to tell them, like, no, you don't. Don't you realize how good you have it? That's the, the, the point is like something is in the water here and this is a problem. And so I guess so just I'm going to throw some numbers out at you just to, you know, put some stats behind the uh, the qualitative. Uh, so in the recent New York Times poll, and this is where, you know, it was the bad Sienna one that everyone freaked out about. Sixty two percent of Biden voters in swing states thought the economy was fair or poor, fair or poor. And 97 percent of Trump voters thought the same. Among Biden voters age 18 to 29, 89% that the economy was fair or poor. Now, fair you could live with. And actually, I mean, maybe my producer can give me the breakdown between how many of those were fair versus how many of those were poor. But it means that nobody thinks it's good, uh, which I think if you talk to people at the Fed, right, and you looked at the macroeconomic numbers, there's a lot of people who would be like, the economy is growing, the GDP rate is growing. Uh, incredibly fast. Unemployment is very low. Like by normal metrics, and this is my going to be my point. This is my thesis. By normal metrics, the economy is good. Good to fair. Good to fair. Not pretty poor. Good. Pretty good. That's what pretty I like. Good. It's yeah. pretty good. Pretty good, right? And so I see a lot from you and like people like Matt Iglesias, whatever. And, you know, just recently Thanksgiving, there was a lot of, um, I saw a lot of like Twitter posts saying things to the effect of, in Joe Biden's terrible economy, it's so good that all these people can afford to travel. Uh, and, right, okay, so like normal economic indicators would, I think, seem like, yeah, okay, so pretty good. So is it, and I'm actually going to ask this as a question because I'm not sure, but I think my thesis is that uh, voters now expect a different level of economic positivity. Like it is you you make an argument that I think is is mired in sort of a expectation from voters 30 or 40 years ago who had like parents or grandparents who remembered the you know the great recession, not the one in 2008, but the one in uh 1928. Um depression, the depression, depression the great not depression, recession. Yeah, not the recession, great depression. depression. Sure. Uh, and so there was just not an expectation that the economy was always going to be good. And I think that actually what's happened is that we have a perception now, an expectation met and where we've been lulled into a sense, right? Like the people right now do not remember interest rates at six or 7%. It was just unheard of. People have been living in sort of good times where even what happened in 2008 felt like it was really bad, but it was like a blip, right? I, Versus, so I think that people can sort of get their arms around a short-term catastrophic place that you climb out of versus a sustained mediocre place, that that actually feels worse to people, the sustained mediocre place, and that it is a 
perception thing. What do you think of that? So I am not going to argue against the truth or falsity of that because it may be true. But if it's true, it's insane. Because if people have forgotten, I understand that 2008 was a million years ago, right? In the same way that everything before COVID was a million years ago. But here's what happened during the Great, the great Recession. Unemployment went from 5%, 5% to 9.5%. Can you imagine what people would do today if unemployment was at 9.5%? 2% of every home in America went into foreclosure. One out of every 50 homes in the country went into foreclosure. Like, th and, and this is not 1930. This is 2008, 2009. I, I just don't understand how to, to, how to level set anything, you know, with something that, again, just happened like five minutes ago. But it turns out, like, people really can't remember that. And I, I don't agree that like, well, if they had to go back, you know, if we just imported the 2008, 2009 economic conditions to today, people would be like, you know, more sublime about it because it's a momentary shock. I think people would lose their minds if something like 2008 happened today. I agree they would lose their minds, I guess. Um, again, like 10% unemployment. Like, can you imagine what, no, what the feeling would look but, like? But in again, America, I think the shocks to the, I think what I'm, trying to argue is that the shocks to the system that then we recover from within like a four year span, that that actually works, that that's like mentally people can compute that better than they can uh, just sustained mediocrity. But it, but it was a, but I say, so I I'll disagree with that again too, because the recovery from the great recession was like a six year thing. I mean, this is one of the reasons Obama's re uh, reelection was so close Right. So Obama's reelect was a very close run affair. And it's because the economy recovered, but it recovered very slowly. Right. And there, this is every, it's all anybody talked about it was like, this is the worst recovery ever because it just dragged out and it never felt like we were all the way back. And it took six years before we really finally felt like, hey, you know, everything is actually back on track. And that's the economy that Trump then inherited. Right. With things things going very well. And so I like, again, we were, we were just here. We just had one of these things. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that the, the Biden administration went so heavy on stimulus because one of the lessons learned by economists from how long and prolonged that recovery was from the great recession was that Obama had been too parsimonious and that Democrats should have spent more money faster to, to goose the recovery along. And okay. so, you know, like everybody's fighting the last war and that's, that's why we spent probably more money than we should have on recovery this time around. So let me hit you with a different theory. Remember when Biden talked about the K-shaped economic recovery and how some people were doing really well and then others weren't? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we're seeing here? I mean, wouldn't that explain why some people are buying boats, which is an example you like to use, and others are barely getting by? I, I would say for people who don't read me, um, boat sales in America are at an all-time high. Never, never been more boats being sold in America. Make of that what you will. Uh, I, I don't think that's right. Again, I'm I'm sure it's how people feel, but it does it isn't right. When you look at the data on this, I have, you know, again, I did a lot of research and homework for this. Uh, the biggest gains in terms of wages relative to, uh, so these are these are real real wage gains being adjusted for inflation. The biggest have gone to the bottom twenty five percent. So if you were in the bottom twenty five percent of uh, household income you have seen the largest gains relative to, to where you were of anybody. And the, the people who have seen the, the least are the top 25%. So this has actually been a bottom-led recovery in that sense, but people don't feel it, right? This is the, and, and again, it's nobody feels it, right? The, the people who own businesses don't feel it. The people who are just, you know, working their jobs don't feel it. And I don't, man, I, one of my theories is that when when democratic societies become like untethered to reality, that's when they make terrible choices, right? When when they just re feel like they can say that the earth is flat and there's no big deal or they can say that an election was stolen or that uh, there are a bunch of – there's a conspiracy of pedophiles who like to wear babies' faces um, and that's just like a totally normal accepted thing. When you become unserious like that, that's when – when the whole body politic starts to rot and you wind up with catastrophically bad choices. 
All right. I want to turn to a group of two-time Trump voters uh, that we talked to just a couple days ago uh, who self-identified as very conservative. And Mm. we asked about how or whether inflation is changing their holiday plans this year. And this is what we heard. So I've already talked to a friend who works for Delta, and I've done this before. I'm asking if I could use a buddy pass. It cuts my flights tremendously. It's a little bit of a hassle because you fly standby and you have to wait around. But I don't have another $700 for a holiday three and a half weeks away or four weeks away, whatever it is. I don't have it. Like, I simply don't have it. I usually donate to several organizations. I'm not going to be able to do it. I usually adopt several kids here. They call it Angel Tree at my school. I picked one. I spent $60 and I got good deals and I'm just calling it a day. I just have to be smarter. But we try to vacation at least once a year. So we had one planned up for this coming year. And then we had a family member that's getting married, but they're getting married in Disney World. And they want my girls to be in the wedding, which is beautiful and wonderful. But now I have to pay for Disney World vacation on top of everything else. And it's just... The prices for flights, the prices for tickets and stuff like that. Like even when you do try to cut back, I mean, like life happens. And then when you do try to like splurge or do something like those prices are even so much more expensive than what they used to be, too. Around Christmas time, I usually drive my parents. I drive them down to see their extended family very far south, Indiana. Basically, it's Kentucky. They they basically live right on the border. We just can't do it this year. Everything is just too expensive. And they have a significantly smaller place. They're, they're thinking of, of bringing the people from down south up to us. But I, I honestly, I just don't know if that would work. It, my parents have just such a smaller house. Uh, we might just you know do a Zoom call this year. We set a, a budget for Christmas, break it down by each grandchild and each daughter. Trying to keep my wife in that budget is the, is the biggest <laughs> anxiety I have. Well, this year, she's done pretty well. So a little bit more focus on it this year because things are so tight. So here is part of my pushback to your mass delusion uh, theory, which is people are making – and they this, is, this was this one group where we asked about how they were approaching the holidays, and people talked about a ton of behaviors that they were changing. And this is actually one of the things I hear in the focus groups all the time. People talk about – things they specifically do differently. They drive less or they don't take this trip or they don't do this. And I think, um, and, and I think some of these aren't captured by some of the economic indicators. Like one of the things you hear from people who own small businesses are like things that they don't update. Or you hear from parents who had a baby who want to upgrade on a house, but can't because of where the interest or feel like they can't because of the interest levels. And so I think that, or how do you, I guess, grapple with the idea between, okay, so it's just a mass delusion and people are just saying they feel a way even though it's not true versus the fact that they are actually having to make different choices because they feel uh, the actual uh, weight of the economy on them in that way. I mean, I would be hard pressed to believe that there is a moment in any middle class family's life when they are not making hard choices about spending, right? This is, this is not this idea that like people weren't like tightening their belts over this or like thinking about, can we do two vacations? Can we do one vacation? Like that, like the 10 years ago it was like, no, this is what it means to be a middle-class family in America. Uh, you think it's hard to buy a house starting out now? It's almost always hard to buy a house starting out. It wasn't during the dot-com bubble, but then it got hard really after like the, we live in a very, very difficult red and tooth and claw economic environment. And there is like a brief window in your mid fifties after your kids have left the house before you go on a fixed income where you can have some breathing space, but it's always hard. So I don't, I don't mean to say like, Oh, you know, pull up your big girl pants. Like it's easy. It's not. I just don't think it's materially different. And and here's, I mean, I, I do have some questions. Uh, first of all, so Corey from Ohio, who's the one who talked about the the high costs of going to Disney World, right? He is going to Disney, like he's taking, they're still taking a big trip. He's going to Disney World. And if the economy is so bad, how is his family affording a Disney wedding? Disney weddings are phenomenally expensive, right? This is like a classic, a classic thing. And I, I'm, I don't know, can we get into Corey? 
because Corey is one of the people that I, I spent a lot of time looking at the things he said. Is that all right to do? Or do you want to go ahead? You, you, I, in fact, I specifically set this up. You argue with the people and I'm going to rest my voice and eat chicken noodle soup. Good, good. Hello, America. Welcome to JVL's complainy time. What I've wanted to do is burst through the the mirror on the focus group, like the Kool-Aid man, and, and argue back with them. But this is the next best thing. So here's something that Corey from Ohio, the same guy who talked about his, his trip to Disney World and how expensive it is. He talked in another part of his focus group about he is a teacher at a juvenile detention center. And here, here's Corey saying, he says, I'm seeing kids that are murdering other kids that are coming in and then getting out within six to eight months. So when I heard this, I just, my head snapped back and I thought, huh, that sounds really bad. Is that true? And so I started doing some digging on how, you know, juvenile offenses work in Ohio. And it, it turns out that in Ohio, they have very strict sentencing guidelines for minors who commit murder. Uh, if you are over the age of 14, you have a mandatory SYO. That means a severe youth offender uh, penalty system, which kicks in. You have to do the first part of your sentence in juvenile detention until you're 21. And then the rest of it moves into, you know, the adult pokey when you're when you're finished. If you're under 14, there is some discretion with the judge as to whether or not you get an SYO or not. But it still is incredibly rare for anybody to to wind up out of juvenile detention before the age of 21 for murder. And that's the question of how many murders there are. In Ohio, we're looking at about 30 juvenile murders per year. I really wonder if it is true that Corey has seen multiple minors who have committed murder getting out of his juvenile detention center in six to eight months. That just seems highly unlikely to me. And so, you know, like, I don't mean to be sitting here like Matlock and peaching the witness, but if this guy <laughs> is sure? telling you this story about things he sees in his work life that could not possibly be true, or at least seem highly unlikely, given what we know about the actual laws in Ohio and the number of murders committed by juveniles in Ohio, then how much can you really trust when he says, oh, yeah, and things are terrible and I'm not spending, you know, because maybe he's spending things other ways. There was a, a, a huge, stupid, you know, social media fight about the price of hamburgers. Do you, did you see this, Sarah, like a week ago? And it was uh, somebody on TikTok was like, I just paid $16 for a, a Happy Meal or something. And then two people from The Washington Post tried debunking it. And then Nate Silver comes in and piles on and Nate says, yeah, I mean, the real problem is that the Uber Eats have gotten more expensive and that, you know, Uber Eats and Grubhub now charge all sorts of extra fees. And so getting your burger from the McDonald's two blocks away from your apartment now costs like twenty five dollars when it used to cost like twelve dollars. So what is that story about? That is a story about people's changing consumption habits, right? They're not just buying fast food. They're using delivery services now, which they didn't do five years ago. And the delivery companies, because of the abandonment of the zero interest rate policy, ZERP, which made all sorts of like weird manias possible in the tech world and allowed companies to lose hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter because they were scaling up. And now these companies have to like make money. So they're charging charging more for their services. And so, you know, I don't know what I'm saying is consumption habits change. And I absolutely buy that people, you know, say, well, this other thing that I used to do costs more and nothing has changed, but I suspect they're probably using Uber Eats more than they did five years ago because it didn't exist. Right. And, and because the pandemic got people and because used the pandemic to it, got people, right. Which is, right. By the way, a big part of my also theory of why people feel the way they do. I think people had more money during the pandemic because they didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And uh, also they were sending out stimulus checks. And uh, I think people just felt actually more flush uh, than they do today. And I also think that that blip of two years of not spending money caused both as prices did rise with inflation caused kind of a shock to people's systems then when they like got back in the travel game and it was all more expensive and fuel costs were more expensive, uh, they had sort of it hadn't they hadn't gradually gone up in their minds. It was just a shock to the system. And a lot of people were out of work during the pandemic, right? Yeah. In, unemployment spiked, got really really high, uh, and it came back down quickly. This is what I'm saying. Again, the answer isn't like everything's amazing. Why aren't you people smiling? That's not. 
it is like things are pretty good compared to the very recent past, both in 2020 when things were terrible and in 2008 when things were act positively scary. Things are amazingly good. And yet people feel as though things are worse today than they were either in 2020 when the pandemic was crushing the economy or in 2008, 2009 during the Great Recession. That's the disconnect. Okay. So I want to play some food uh, since you just brought up the hamburgers uh, and McDonald's. I've got, we've got some sound on food. Let's listen to what people, because I think one of the biggest ways that people talk about getting pinched in their daily lives is the cost of food. And I'll just note every clip you're going to hear from here on out is just a variety of political parties because they all basically sound the same. Where it really is hard is when you go to the grocery store or you take your family out to eat and just going to, let's say, McDonald's for a quick $20 lunch three or four years ago is now, you know, $40 or 50 bucks for fast food. So it's really challenging. And we're a family of five. I used to be able to go to the store, spend $150, and that would get us for a good two-ish weeks. And I'm a bargain shopper. Shop at Aldi, shop the sales. and now I'm I spend one hundred and fifty dollars at the grocery store, and it's like if I need like proteins, you know, it's half of what we were worth getting. I tell you what, like when Trump was president, we used to be able to buy food and eat meat. I mean, we're living like vegetarians now, where we can barely afford anything anymore. I mean, I have to work six nights a week just to keep going, and. It's just, it's bad. I've never seen it this bad, actually. You go to the store, wherever you go shopping, and you get like three bags of groceries, like $80. Mm -hmm. And I take out like four items. You know what I mean? It's like vegetables and chicken. It's like, you see other countries and they have the healthiest products. We have the crappiest products in our foods. And yet for us to eat healthy, we have to pay triple the price. So... You know, Look I'm actually at me gonna, being a good boy, Sarah. Yeah. So actually, before please validate just, me. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll right through a couple more sections just because we've talked a lot. I think our theories have been established. And I want people to hear that was food, and then I want to do the other one where I, that I hear a lot, which is the number one that I hear for why people want Trump back, which is gas prices, uh, which they remember as being considerably lower during uh, Trump when Trump's presidency. Let's listen. I paid $3.19 for gas and thought I got a bargain. Do I want to go visit my friend in Savannah this weekend? Oh, wait, no, I can't. I don't have $100 for gas. And I'm sorry. I work very, very hard, sometimes two and three jobs. I paid four fifty five for gasoline this weekend. I go into the grocery store, a jar of mayonnaise, $7. People pay attention to that. And things were running pretty good in this country when Trump was in. I don't care whether you like him or not. You don't have to marry him. Let's go what's best for the country. I uh, recently had my car serviced and my mechanic came back and said, you really ought to uh, change your spark plugs. And I said, OK, well, how much is that? He goes, nine hundred dollars. I said, what? Six spark plugs are nine hundred dollars. I'll look for another mechanic. Thank you very much. We used to be energy independent and now we're not. And they're shutting down pipelines and, and all that stuff. And it just irritates me. The gas prices are astronomical if you have to buy a car. It's ridiculous. We unfortunately had to buy two cars this year. And a used car price now is $10,000 above what it was three years ago. They're making up all these charges to, oh, your gas really isn't near $4 a gallon and under Trump it was $2. Or, oh, your home prices are $450,000 with 10% interest. But we don't want you to look at all these things that impact you. We want you to Oh, Trump is going to be put in prison. Now, this is the disconnect, actually. Oh, I have so many things to I say. I know, but you want to <laughs> argue the facts vibrating. with them. All right. If you want to argue the facts, go ahead. I know you want to take, but I, it's, I know you want to do it. I will just say, I can't say whether this guy is right about his $900 spark plugs. Like, I can't, val I can't fact check. I can't fact check that. My point is that it doesn't matter. But you go ahead and argue so look no it doesn't matter right yeah. this is the, this is the point but it does matter i think in the sense of like we're trying to understand is this delusionary or is it real and because because that depends that 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 answer uh dictates how we approach 
persuading people. Right. Uh, so Keel, who talked about his $900 spark plugs, uh, let's pretend he owns a Ford F-150, one of the most popular vehicles in America. Um, in America, the average cost to replace spark plugs on a Ford F-150 is between $250 and $300, including parts and labor, not counting uh, state and local taxes. Um, I'm not going to say that Keel's mechanic did not offer to charge him $900 for a $250 to $300 repair. Uh, but if he did, that's a mechanic problem being dishonest, not a not a cost of spark plugs problem. Catherine saying that she had less than half of what she used to be able to get at the grocery store. Um, that's not possible, right? So grocery prices, we've there's so much research has been done on the inflation of grocery prices, and they have gone up a lot. They've gone up 25%. In order to get half of what you used to get, then prices would have to go up 100%. When prices go up 25%, you get 80% of the same goods you used to get. That's that like, again, just people are unreliable narrators. But the one that I, I, I love the most was the, we used to be energy independent and now we're not. So energy independence is like a slippery thing. Like most people, when they talk about that, they mean importing oil, right? America has been importing oil since 1950. We have not been energy independent on petroleum since 1950. It's not like, you know, back when when Cheeto Jesus was in office, like we got all of our oil from from the ground in Tejas. Uh, I think there, there's like a slightly more complicated sense in which uh, some economists measure like net net energy production and usage in the U.S. And in that sense. Here's like a germ of truth. And this is like maybe so maybe she read this in like the Epoch Times or something. Um, under Trump, for the first time, we became net energy positive in the U.S. in 2019, uh, which is really great. The thing is that our net energy positive status has continued to increase each year since 2019. And in fact, in 2022, reached the highest mark ever under Joe Biden. And also, if you care about the oil stuff, we are currently in the highest levels of domestic oil production in America's history. So here's somebody saying like, oh, we're shutting down pipelines. And you're like, what is that? What is that related to? And again, I don't think, you know, I'm sure part of it is like misinformation because they're listening to Fox and stuff and part of his other. But the point of this isn't to like yell, you bad people, you're wrong. Why aren't you smarter? It's to understand again, what's going on? Is there is there really a problem with policy levers to fix? Or is this a vibes problem, which then is, you know, is really more about messaging and comms? Uh, and so I want to have the conversation about comms, because uh, if it is just a vibes problem, you think it's worse than uh, and scarier. I don't because I see that as mm -hmm. I think they have much more control over whether or not they can fix their communications problem than whether or not they can fix an economy that's flailing. Um, right. In terms of what a president can do, what a uh, comm shop can do. But let me just I, I, I mean, I don't really want to fight with you. I know you did a lot of research. You could come back at these people with the things that they said about what they believe so that you could, like take the 25% in the grocery store. Okay. So aggregate and aggregate prices have gone up 25%. That doesn't mean that when, cause the things that have gone up the most are things like bread and are things like uh, eggs are things like staples. And so like you, this is one of my frustrations with you is you go and take whatever the wall street journal or the fed or somebody else. And you take the aggregate numbers and you don't think, okay, well that might be true across every single grocery product. Cause lots of them have either gotten cheaper or stayed the same or whatever. But that like, if people are just trying to go to the grocery store and they're trying to get salad stuff, vegetables, chicken, like all of those things have gotten way more expensive. And, and I'll tell you what I was struck by when she was talking about the food, which is she said $80 and my Whole Foods in Washington, D.C. brain went, oh, my God, you can get three bags of groceries for $80? That sounds like so much. At Whole Foods in Washington, D.C., you can get half a bag of groceries for $80 and you got some cheese. And like what? And that's because we, this is one of my, this is one of my big things is I, uh, I do think that people who live in the suburbs and in the cities experience a very different economy than somebody who is shopping at Aldi and has been shopping at Aldi for a family of five and is living on somewhere between a minimum wage and like a lower class salary, gig economy salary. Uh, and that the employment numbers uh, today are different than the employment numbers were 20 years ago because it includes a whole bunch of like 
gig jobs uh, and not full-time jobs that give them any kind of health insurance. And I don't want to sound like a lib here. Uh, I just, I think there are ways for, my point is I think there are ways for both things to be true, that your numbers are true and that the experience these people are having is also true. I mean, sure. And uh, look, this is America and, you know, you, I'm the, I'm the commie here. Like th even when things are booming, right. And you know, like when everything, all the indicators are pointing in the same direction, there are always people who are going to be a little worse off than they were before. Right. Like we, our economy has winners and losers in it. And that's just like, that's the system we chose and that's the system we all live in. So I'm not ever going to say like, you know, Oh, everybody's better. They're, that's never true. And I'm, I'm sure there are many, many people, some large percentage of people for whom things aren't. Uh, but again, that's not what the consumer attitudes show, right? Because like we do, we just know for a fact that uh, household wealth and median households adjusted for inflation over the last three years is up 37%. That's just a fact. And what we see in the consumer sentiments surveys is that the vast majority of people don't recognize that and they think they're worse off. Yeah. Now some of this, so let's just get to a little bit of the, like, where do vibes come from? So uh, I think that basically I, my contention is it's more lived experience than I think sort of you grant. But one of the things that I, I do think is, I, I, but I also agree that there are vibes elements to this. And I think part of that comes from the fact that for a long time, all the headlines were, we're going to go into a recession. And now if you ask voters, uh, and this is what I call high level narrative setting. So part of what happens is when everyone's like, oh my God, we're going to go into a recession. Oh my gosh, we're going to go into a recession. And then what happened is we like slowly, methodically, like jobs report by GDP growth report moved out of like red zone territory for entering a recession. And I just think that people and like people like, so then like, those are one day stories. They're kind of like these one day stories of, uh, Oh look, actually job growth exceeded expectations again. Uh, inflation is not down, but it is cooling, you know, whatever. It was flat over the last month. Right. But which just means <laughs> it's not going up though. It just means it's not going up and it's, it's, it's at a very high level. And so what you need is for it to come down. Um, no, no, no. You don't want deflation. Well, so here's the problem, though. This, I mean, now this we're in an economic argument, right? Where like, what does Joe? What do they do about the actual economy? Because actually, the economy is so hot on like they are the reason that inflation or the reason that interest rates are so high is actually an attempt by the government to cool the economy. They are trying to repress the economy, and it uh, seems to have worked. And it seems to say. have worked. Right. And so, but with that. Because they are actually trying to cool down the economy. Why would it not? Why would you not accept the fact that the economy is, in fact, cooling and in a tough place? I mean, I guess I understand. You're making the point that that no, no, no. You, you, it is. It's just not as bad as people sound when they're catastrophizing. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is a soft landing. This is the the mythical soft landing that every economist dreams of. I so I think this is probably this is a very clear like where you and I both come from difference. You look at this and think that this is a case of people getting information because you come from comms, right? And so the information is shaping them. I I think the answer is probably even simpler. I think the answer is probably that COVID broke people's brains. Like we went through this once in a century global pandemic, which changed how Every single person in America lived their life in an hour by hour, day by day way for like two years. We had a million Americans die. One million Americans die of this thing. One out of every 300 people in America died. And yet we've sort of weirdly memory hold it, right? Like this is every you know, it's like, oh, the thing we don't talk about. Why would we be back to normal? I, I saw some, some today, there was like a headline somewhere about, uh, you know, Oh, these Gen Zers are all germaphobes. Isn't, you know, new study shows that, uh, you know, 15 to 25 year olds are obsessed with germs. They're like, yeah, no shit. Why would that be? You know, <laughs> did they all just undergo being locked inside their houses for two years because of a novel virus, which killed a million of their fellow citizens? Of course, like it just. 
And so, so that seems to me like the Occam's razor explanation. So right? I, I agree. I mean, I think that COVID actually can explain a lot of the perception uh, differences. I think 100%. I agree with that. So here's the thing, though. It's, for me, it's not just comps. For me, it's lived experience, right? So I'm listening to these voters and the focus. If I wasn't listening to these voters all the time, I would kind of have a different perspective. I just hear it too often across the political spectrum that I do not impute just, it would be easy for me, I think, if I wasn't listening to them to say, this is a lot of Fox News, this is a lot of catastrophizing for Republicans to make Joe Biden look bad or because they genuinely think Joe Biden is doing bad things to the economy, but it doesn't comport with reality. Whereas I just hear it so often and from so many different types of people. And I don't mean often, I mean like number one thing all the time. Everybody says it. I just will not doubt that level of people articulated. Show. Yeah, I, but I, I, I listen to your show. It's the, literally the first thing that every group, regardless of their political ID, says to you. Exactly. Exactly. And so, like, for me, I'm just like, this is real. And then I start to think, okay, when it's real, what do you do about it? So, one is obviously the economy needs to go from soft landing from worst outcome to like, actively good. There has to be like an active improvement. Inflation does need to come down. People have to feel, I think, in the places that are the basics, because that's the thing you hear about the most. It's gas, it's eggs, it's milk, it's chicken. It's like, you know, it's like the the most basic things, those prices have to come down. Because I think that's what's really hurting people. Now, on the other hand, and also like Joe Biden's doing responsible things with the economy, whereas Donald Trump ran the economy really hot. And so I like there was a lot of sugar highs in the Trump economy. Yeah. Uh, they borrowed a lot of money. They cut taxes. And so like the economy raised the was, debt and raised the Biden administration. Yeah, hand, that's right. And so Joe Biden actually being slightly more responsible, I think, um, creates a cooler. And but I will say, but here's where I get to vibes in the comms part. I just think there are marginal ways in which they could do a much better job of articulating, I mean, literally everything that's happening. Um, <laughs> but like one of the things that is so weird to me, and I'm interested in what you think, calling it Bidenomics to me was like a real premature, weird branding situation. Like what makes somebody be like, you know, the vast majority of uh, voters believe that the economy is not doing well. Uh, so let's slap Biden's name on it. Uh, like you do that with popular things. You do that once you've won the argument. And so I think that by calling it Bidenomics and just running around saying Bidenomics is working, I think they've painted themselves into a really tough spot when voters are like, actually, I think the economy sucks. And so now I blame Biden because his name's on it. So I, I, I heard you say this on the last show and I, it's a rare moment where I think I disagree with you on something regarding communications, uh, this strikes me as like the age thing, like the Kamala Harris thing, uh, because it's a real vulnerability. The answer is to put a lantern on it mm-hmm. and hug it until mm-hmm. you change until you change people's minds so that then you own it. You can. But I think but I see that here's the thing. I think they should work to change people's minds. Like I don't I actually think Democrats are far too timid in trying to create their own reality. So I come from a Republican comms background. I've watched Republicans operate uh, now for most of my career. And let me tell you what Republicans do. They create their own reality. They create their own echo chambers. And one of the things that Trump did early on in his administration was he would run around. I also say this all the time. And he would be like, hey, best economy for black people, best economy for women. Uh, Hey, buddy, how's your 401k on every shop floor? And that enthusiasm, right? And then every other Republican would repeat it. Uh, He just had this list that he would run down all the time. And I do think that that created vibes and it created a broad, high-level narrative of an idea that things were good and working. Now, I also think economic numbers were better. They had more to work with then. Uh, And they were talking about things like tax cuts and everything, and they avoided pulling out of Obamacare, uh, which I think actually would have done a great deal of damage to Trump's presidency on just like pure policy grounds. But like, I don't think that Biden does nearly, and it's because they don't have like a strong person to communicate this stuff, which is to go out and say not that the economy is great, but to go out and say, we were heading into a recession, which Trump drove us into because of COVID, because he mishandled the whole thing. Millions of people's di- people died. The economy was in the toilet. And I have been climbing us out of it. That's what I've been doing. I've been having to painstakingly dig us out of his mess. And nobody makes that case. Nobody. It'd be nice to have like 2008 era Bill Clinton on this, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Any, Rahm Emanuel, just like a bunch of attack dogs out there being like, you did this, bro. And and, and yet more. they let it persist. Uh, they just let it hang there as a truism, which is to me why in part, like, I think – because I, I think that there there is, on one hand, a lot of lived experience that I don't think there's you can counter. On the other hand, I think that it has become such a truism for all people that even the people who are doing quite well by comparison, like I think there's a lot of people really struggling, but then I think there's a bunch of people who've just decided the economy's bad, even though they personally are doing quite well. And a lot of those people are the college-educated suburban too. voters yeah. that voted for Biden last time that are now saying they're backsliding to Trump because of the economy. And those are the people that they've got to get out there with a bullhorn in their ear being like, actually, you're doing great. and Or not, you're doing great. You are doing quite well. And Donald Trump left, put us in this position, and we fixed it. Yeah, I mean, also, things are just objectively better, right? How is your 401k when Don on election day 2020, the Dow Jones average was 28,000. Today we're at 33,000, right? On election day, unemployment was at 6.7%. Today we're at 3.8%. Like just, you know, hey, you have a job, you have a job, you have a job. Your 401k is doing great, isn't it? Like this is, I, I think these are easy things to do, but but they're only easy if people are receptive to rational argument. And that's that's where I start to worry, right? Because when you see, you saw some some of the some of the people in the focus group. There's one of your Trump Trump two time voters who was talking about how terrible things are now relative to 2022. It's really like, yeah, you know, last year things were fine, but this year things are terrible. And I bet if you go back to 22, that that same voter would have told you, oh yeah, things are terrible this year. They're you know, but last year they were much better, right? Now. 2021 was a very good year. I think everybody was happy about things in 2021 because we were still riding the sugar high and hadn't hadn't come back to reality yet. But I I do wonder how receptive people are to rational argument on this and how much is just, you know, like we're all disconnected from reality and we think that everything will basically be fine no matter what we choose and that you know, if we go with the guy who attempted a coup again, like whatever, like it was fine ultimately anyway, and this will be fine too. That's not how they think though. They think this guy's a businessman. This guy had a good economy last time. I, you know. He didn't. Okay, he didn't. This, this this weird, I'm just, I'm I, mean, I asked you to explain thing. something to and, me. Well, okay. But I really want to hear them talk about housing, but go ahead. What do you want me to explain to you? So housing I'm here for, because this is like the one economic complaint, which is absolutely real and valid. And there's, there's a lot to talk about. Um, this is not the one economic complaint. The inflation complaint is real too, but the housing is even more valid. Um, what I don't understand, because never in my life, you know, America is, we famously say, that's great what you did in the past, but what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. Right? And it doesn't matter that you won a Super Bowl two years ago. Last season, your team was uh, six and 10. So you're out of here, coach. Why is it that Donald Trump is the guy who everybody looks at and says, well, sure, the last 18 months of his presidency were an absolute disaster, but look how good things were before then. Nobody in no other walk of life, in no other piece of politics, does anybody evaluate people that way? Everything is always, yeah, but how were things when you walked out the door? I don't think And so. this idea that people just go like, oh, sure. Trump was great, though, for those first two and a half years before that nasty COVID thing happened. So that is what they think. The they think that COVID. Why? They, Why they is that for him? COVID and for was exogenous. Else. They see it happen in every other country. Uh, they they it, it is it is. But I mean, I've always you and I do agree that there's like a, there's a submit. Right. A, is, America has the lowest inflation rent of inflation rate of any G7 country. This is what we do right? in the secret podcast. We just yell at each other and Sorry, talk over each other. I'll no, there, I, I agree with you that there's this asymmetric judgment uh but also there's just no doubt people look at covid as this like meteor that came out of the sky differential and so they do not judge a lot of things that trump did and what's weird about that is trump got to like we were living in covid and so he got sort of forgiven in a way that it's like a like a flood or some other catastrophe the aftermath of joe biden having to clean it up which has been sort of painstaking and hard and piecemeal because we're not living in COVID anymore, people have this unrealistic expectation that everything would just bounce back super fast. Yeah, as it's opposed to like, beating COVID, so that we don't have to like live in our basements anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and in 2022, people were down on the economy, but it was like for different reasons. Uh, people always talk about gas prices, but what people were talking about then was the um, supply chain. And right. the fact that, like, they couldn't find anything. They didn't have anything. Uh, nobody was there to serve them at restaurants. It was like we were opening back up, but 
life was still different and people were frustrated with that, all the flights being canceled. I remember how people were in 2022, similarly negative, just like slightly different reasons. Okay, let's do housing because um, this is like another one that you just hear all the time. And especially with young voters, we just, we've got another episode with Peter Hamby, um, actually that's going to air before this one. So you will have already heard it. And one of the things they talk about in that episode is just the young people, like the just impossibility of getting into the housing market. Let's listen. Yeah. Well, the rent is horrible. I don't rent, but I feel really bad for people who do rent. But people who have a mortgage, insurance went up, car insurance went everything's going up. The price of a used car is going up. So financially, it's devastating. I keep seeing that uh, inflation is decreasing, but I won't speak for anybody else, but it may be decreasing, but I don't see my dollar going any farther. Gas prices are rising again. Just basic everyday living costs are, are, are outrageous at this point. Mortgage rates, as an example, I, I don't know how anybody's going and getting new houses with 7 8% rates. Unfortunately, I locked mine in at two and a half years ago, and I can't imagine going you know, up that 7 8% right now. The idea, I think for Gen Z or younger people, the idea of owning a home seems really far-fetched now. It seems like something that's going to be just very, very difficult to do. You almost would have to have to do some sort of crash or, you know, you have to start making a lot of money and things like that. And for everyone that I know around me, all the people that I know around me that do own a home or like, you know, have a mortgage or are buying a home, they got a large amount of assistance whether being from like family members, you know, covering their down payment, things like that. I think I'm the oldest here, but I feel like nobody our age is, you're not going to get a house for a while. You're probably not going to retire. And that is a really grim outlook. When Trump was in office, that kind of gives a glimmer of hope to me because I'm hoping to look to potentially buy a house soon. And like I mentioned earlier with like just everything just skyrocketed in price, like to afford the average house in Arizona, you need to be making like 100, 100 150 plus a year. And it's it's kind of ridiculous. So hopefully a change like that would, you know, be for the better. Okay. So the, recently there was a Wall Street uh, Journal poll that said that only 36% of Americans thought that the American dream was in reach, which was down from 53% in 2012 when the economy was actually a lot worse. And so I think part of my concern about the way that people talk about the economy is it's just not, it's not just the economy as they experience it right now. It's that there's this longer term sort of deeper sense of despair setting in uh and people talk really you know they don't think that they can they're not like don't feel like they have upward mobility the ability to achieve things and so um what do you what do you make of that because i think that that the people the the thing that i'm hearing and that guy last guy was an example of this is that because people have this sort of despair over the long term they think well if we bring trump back you bring Trump back, the economy could get better again. And that's like, that's what they, they're willing to overlook all kinds of things to make the economy better. Uh, what do you make of that? Congratulations, America. You now see the world exactly as every member of the Gen X generation has seen it their entire lives. Like the, everything is stacked against you. It's impossible to buy a home. Uh, you're never going to retire. Don't even count on social security being in existence when you do hit 70. Uh, like this is this is how people of my age co cohort have lived through their entire adulthood, right? You know, I I came out of college into a recession, uh, not as bad as the one that people who graduated in like two thousand eight, two thousand nine came into, but uh, these things are all timing based. And if you you know the baby boomers won the lottery, this is I don't know if you listened to Tim's conversation with Scott Galloway, um, but he talked about how being born in California. At the the in the year that he was as a white guy, meant that he got to go to a world class university for like uh, you know five bucks and a and a bag of beans, and then come out into an incredibly hot job market, into an incredibly undervalued real estate market, while we were in the midst of building tons of homes, and that like dictated everything in his life, uh, and that is basically where we are now. The housing stuff is real. The Case Shiller Index on housing affordability is at the worst mark that I think it's ever been in. Um, but also, it hasn't been great for a long time. The, the guy who talked about, like, you know, maybe it'll be better when when Trump comes back. In quarter four, 2016, uh, the time of the 2016 election, the median home price was 
a median home price was 311,000. Uh, by the time Trump left office, it was 370,000. This is again, adjusted for inflation. Um, so these things were rising then too. And this is housing prices are not a function of the federal government. Uh, there is, there is an interest rate component into it, which is the fed. The rest of it is about building more homes. And this is a thing which is of enormous interest to all sorts of like new urbanists and, and planners. Uh, they want more housing to be built. The problem is that we've seen often when you get more housing being built, you get luxury housing being built, which can help a little bit, right? Any number of housing units you put onto the market decreases the pressure on prices in the market total. But if all you're doing is building a high, high end luxury where you know people are buying these units and trading them as NFTs, it's not putting all that much pressure on it. Uh, so housing reform, absolutely something that needs to be tackled, uh, especially at state and local levels. And this is, it's a big part of everything, right? This is what we have a homeless crisis in the way that they don't in like the Scandinavian countries. Why is that? It's because they build housing. Um, so there, there's a whole thing to go along with this. But this is the one thing where I have total sympathy for everybody who says the price of house. It feels like I'll never be able to afford a house. I'm surprised, actually, just as I think about it right now, that Trump doesn't put more emphasis on building, considering that's like his background. I mean, he, of course, scammed everybody out of everything and, and uh, stiffed all his <laughs> vendors. But like he was a developer in New York. And the idea of like building more uh, seems like a kind of thing that could be a rallying cry that a lot of people would respond to in this moment. Maybe this is the weird thing, though. I don't think Trump's people want more housing built. Right. I mean, Trump's Trump's base is largely older white Americans. Uh, they do not need more housing built. Right. This is the this is primarily a young person's problem. And anytime you get into question, the reason we, we have trouble building more housing is because of the the nimbyism. You know, yeah, this is right. Want You're more correct. Units being built. And so for Trump, you know, for Trump to talk about that, people might think, well, wait a minute. Is that going to bring the wrong sort of element into uh -huh. our communities? Right. Uh so I, I think that's, he doesn't need to do that. Yeah. Great point. Okay. Uh, I just want to get through, um, one more thing. Cause there's one more area we haven't really touched on that people talk about a lot in the groups, which is their work lives. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of people we're talking to are not in cushy sort of six figure jobs. Not that it's all six figure jobs are cushy, uh, but they do, you know, tough, often underpaid, uh, stuff. So let's listen to how they talk about their wages and staffing shortages. I'm in hospitality and it's tough around here with the economy. And in my local area, they've just really raised property taxes. So that has everybody upset in our city because income hasn't gone up. And then since the exodus of workers in 2020, we still can't find workers. So if you're trying to run a business, you're having to pay a lot more. We're hiring staffing services. So I'm not that optimistic. I don't see how it can be fixed yet. Like my fiance, he is on track to make a thousand dollars less than he did last year, which was the same as the year before. I think a lot of people didn't get raises or, you know, quality of life raises the past couple of years. Um, my friend, you know, he just finished a firefighting academy and he's like, I don't really understand it. You know, I go through all this pressure, all this money that I have to spend in on equipment and we're only making 60,000. You know, that really hasn't changed. And that's South Florida too. So it's it should be like, you know, higher than the average compared to like small cities. And this obviously has more issues for what they have to do. And he's like, they really haven't changed the costs uh, for inflation I work at a big, huge hospital and we're short staffed. We're working more than 16 hours a day, you know, six days a week. But then we hire people, they come in for one day and then they no call, no show the rest of the time. It's like people don't want to work, but they want to stand out and on the street corner with their signs and says, please help. Well, we all need the help, but nobody's willing to come in and work for it. They just want a handout. Okay. So you can't talk directly to these voters, which is a good thing and by design, because I don't want you to. Uh, but let me, let me ask you this, just as, as we kind of wrap up here. 
what should the Biden administration do? Like, I, I, you are in my fundamental debate over whether it's a delusion, whether it's true lived experience, whether there's a gap uh, where like people are actually the, the economy is actually improving, but it's not making a meaningful enough difference in like the basic things that people need um, or those things are expensive. Like all of that is just sort of you and I talking, because I think at the end of the day, we can both agree if people think the economy is in a really bad place uh, and you throw immigration on top of it, uh, which has both economic and implications for the way people talk about crime, which is sort of two of the other big issues that I would say you really hear on the right and where Biden seems to be really vulnerable based on every single poll we've seen about where people's attitudes are about who they think is best equipped to handle those issues. What are they supposed to do over the next year to get themselves into a better place? Boy, I wish I knew. Uh, I mean, if, if I had that answer... I would have written a really, really great newsletter about it that you would have read eventually. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the answer is probably that they have to disqualify Trump. And you have to disqualify him both on economics and remind people of what things looked like when Trump left uh, and on the chaos stuff and the instability because people don't like chaos and instability. And with that, you got to hope that all of the economic indicators stay where they are, which isn't a guarantee. Get better. Right? Get better. Well, it'd be great if they got a little bit better, although I'm not sure people would admit to it if they did. Um, but uh, but look, it's not you – know, It's sure, all the indicators suggest that we're in the middle of a soft landing, but that could change, right? Why do, why do we think things couldn't get worse? Things could go bad. We could wind up in an actual recession. Uh, that's possible. If that happens, none of this matters. Like, you know, Biden is going to lose. If we get into an actual recession, then Biden will lose full stop. There won't be anything he can do about it. Uh, so I I think that we are in a place where our level of agency is not nearly as high as we would like it to be. Uh, we can all work. We should all work. We should try to save democracy. Uh, the work you do is very important. But on the other hand, it won't be sufficient to, to save democracy, right? We're going to need help from events and need help from the economy, need help from Joe Biden not falling or having a health event himself. But I, you know, can I, can I just, again, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I need to talk to these people one last time okay. on the show. Okay. okay. Uh, so the, the woman from Ohio who's in the hospitality industry, she's complaining about them raising up property taxes. She should take that up with her Republican governor, I assume, not not Joe Biden. Um, and she says that we can't find workers uh, because you have to pay a lot more. And incomes, and she also complains that incomes haven't gone up. That doesn't make sense, right? If, if people have to pay workers more, then incomes are going up. And in fact, that is the reality that we're seeing, right? Incomes are up everywhere, but especially at the lower end of the wage scale. People in the bottom 25% of the wage scale have seen the biggest increases in gains in wages. But the other thing is that that final woman from West Virginia who says that she works at a big, huge hospital, and then we hire people and they come in for one day and then they no call, no show. And the rest of the time it's like people don't want to work, but they want to stand out on the street corner with their signs. Her position stated by her is that people would rather be homeless and be beggars then show up to work at a healthcare sector job. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. I don't believe that that is true. And that's like a fundamental, like, this is just her view of America. And I don't know how anybody changes that. Because if Joe Biden, the guy who loves middle America, the guy who never attacks the MAGAs, the guy who is like, you know, Scranton, Joe, the guy who is... Really, you know, the most centrist and blue collar version of the, the Democratic Party. If he can't change that, then I don't know what hope there is for it. Well, so actually, I mean, I guess this is where I sort of disagree with you is that I think they have quite a bit of agency here and that uh, that a lot of that is about the stories that you tell. Um, and I think, again, even if I take your premise that it is partly a mass delusion, you think that's worse. I think that's better because I think you can 
puncture mass delusions, or at least oh, you you look at the, my thesis and you take the optimistic view of it. You're kidding. <laughs> That's true. This is it's par for the course. Uh, but I think that I don't even think they've done one tenth of what they need to do. And I also think that part of it is they get nervous, right? Because they don't want to say, well, we don't want to argue against people's lived experience. And so they say, so we're going to just tell people all the great things that we've done or whatever. And they get, and but like a Republican would never worry about arguing against people's lived experience because here's what they know. They know that the, 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 the people's lived experiences are vast, right? So right now there are some people who are having a much tougher time and you don't want to tell them that position is wrong, but there's a bunch of people who actually are doing well and are part of those metrics that show people doing well. And I did this rant before, so I'm not going to do the whole thing again, but I think that going out and saying, we have made so much progress from the terrible economy that Trump left us in uh, after COVID because of his mishandling of COVID. You have to remind them about COVID. You have to tell people because people do forget how things happened and why they occurred the way they do. And so they just blame the person in charge like, now. COVID wasn't just during Trump. Like Biden's whole first year was taken up with That's COVID. Right. Nobody remembers this. That's right. And so like the idea, and, and I think part of it is that they might, if, if if we were talking to somebody in the White House comms office, they might be like, we're going to do that. Like or right now we're, we're talking about the infrastructure money that's coming to all these different places. I believe that if they were making a good sustained argument, had hundreds of surrogates all over the place talking about the good economy. So something that happens though, is that I think people get afraid to say, boy, let me just tell you how bad things were because of what Trump did to COVID, how Joe Biden saved us. Pe Democrats like don't want to do that. They are like afraid. And if they can't get their backs up to go make an argument to people that things could have been a lot worse and that actually because of Joe Biden's policies, they're getting better. And actually we can have an optimistic future and actually the they're bringing jobs and manufacturing back because of the, I mean, if they can't find it to have an army of people out there arguing about this. And, you know, you say people don't like chaos. It's true but right now. Like I do think a lot of things have to start going right. Like I think that Israel and Hamas cannot be at war nine months from now. I think that Ukraine needs to have like, I think if, if Russia and Ukraine are still at war and we still have an economy that is where it is, people will feel like that's chaos. They will feel like they're going in the wrong direction. But I think there is an upbeat, uh, optimistic, aggressive contrast, not just contrast with Trump because he's a jerk, contrast with Trump because he's going to take away their health care and he's going to cut taxes for the rich. I mean, some of just the old, I don't want to... I don't need to give Democrats advice, but like the bread and butter politics of it all. And I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I've seen people making any of those compelling cases, not in a sustained way, not through a ton of surrogates. And that's allowing this vibes thing to persist in the places where it may not be as real as in the other places where it's real. So here is, here, here is a, a genuine criticism that I'll, I'll make of the, the Biden administration. I believe their campaign strategy was we're going to keep our powder dry, keep raising money, and we're not going to muddy the waters in the Republican primary because we're yeah. going to let the Republicans take out Trump. And I think that was a huge mistake and a very avoidable mistake. They should have understood that Republicans were never going to attack Trump. And uh, what, they, what they've done instead is allowed all of that, you know, what is your you have a, a great saying about concrete, right? It's, it's soft at first, but then it hardens quickly. Public and opinion is like cement. Public, yeah, that's there. There it is. Um, and that's, that's, you know, the vibes have all congealed so that even, you know, even Democrats just sort of go along with them. They should have been on offense very, very quickly and tried to redefine the Trump presidency for people's, for people's memories. And I don't know if it's too late or not. I hope it's not, but they ought to give it the old college try. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Good show. Very long focus group pod that would only happen with you. Uh, so I appreciate you doing this. Uh, you're the best. And thanks to all of you for listening to the focus group podcast. You are also the best. We've got one more show for you before the holidays next week. And I hope you'll find it a lighthearted way to wrap up the year. No doom and gloom. See you soon.